Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel Cosma Reacts where I learn all things Bara, we your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view in today's video and we're going to look into Mr. Modi and the history of him. So there is a, a video that I've been shared um, and it's quite interesting because um, yeah I actually do know very little about him only obviously uh, from as much as I could have learned here so I'm very very interesting uh, interested in learning a bit more um, about his history and I hope the things that may have brought him to power um, I know many of you in the comments are very uh, you know supportive uh, of his period of uh, you know in India so I'm very curious to learn more and I hope you'll help me on my journey and with that being said before we get into the video I say let's hit it look at this footage Indian armed forces under orders from Narendra Modi are about to do battle with the Chinese People's Liberation Army the location the disputed border region of the Galwan River Valley and this isn't the first time conflict has flared up here but there's something strange about this battle look closely neither side is using modern weaponry it's all just hand-to-hand -hand combat why is this well the Galwan River Valley sits on a disputed border between India and China both nuclear armed nations this flashpoint and the nation's reluctance to use guns and explosives shows us how much is at stake. If the conflict ever went hot, the fallout would be catastrophic. With 25% of the world's population living in India and China, the relationship between the two nations may come to be a defining theme of the 21st century. I've already gone down the rabbit hole of Xi Jinping, but now I want to look at the other half of the equation. Who is Narendra Modi really? Can he lead India to rival China? And how did he come to govern more people than any other leader on Earth? Hmm. Narendra Modi was born into humble beginnings, just after India gained independence from British colonialism. Born in Gujarat, his father sold tea, and his home didn't even have windows. But Narendra wasn't your average child. Around eight years old, he began taking a keen interest in a local organization called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. His experience in the RSS is fundamental to understanding who Modi would become. The RSS was an organization founded on the principles of an Indian nationalist ideology called Hindutva. According to Hindutva, in order to be truly Indian, you have to be Hindu. By the time Modi joined, the RSS was already infamous across India. The famous leader, Mahatma Gandhi, was assassinated by an RSS member who had taken issue with his attempts to reconcile differences between Indian Muslims and Hindus. This didn't prevent Modi from joining, and the man who enrolled him was named Lakshman Rao Inamdar. Remember Inamdar, because he will be a key character in Modi's rise to power. By 1967, Modi had grown into a young man, graduated high school, and was ready to climb the ranks of the RSS. But there was a problem. Modi's parents had arranged for him to be married to a local girl. This was a problem because the RSS prohibited their members from marrying, and doing so would mean that he'd be expelled from the organization. Risking being shunned by his family and community, Modi abandoned his bride-to-be and left Gujarat. After years of soul-searching at various holy sites, Modi would eventually return home, visiting the RSS headquarters and reconnecting with his early mentor, Inamdar. Inamdar saw something in the young Modi. He was full of energy and idealism, but most importantly, he was passionate about Hindu culture. With this in mind, he pushed Modi to take up politics, joining the Bharatiya Janasung, the RSS's political party. So by this point, a young and poor Modi had grown into a politically determined young man and found his calling through Namdar in the RSS. But we need to add some context to what was going on in India at the time. During the collapse of colonialism, the British made a catastrophic miscalculation. South Asia was made up of three main religious groups, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. When the British left, they made the decision to partition the region across these religious lines. However, this created pockets of minorities in each region, totaling nearly 15 million people. Fearing sectarian violence, most chose to flee their homes and migrate across the newly made borders. The ensuing chaos led to the deaths of over 2 million people, and the effects reverberated throughout history, still causing tensions today. This event would be fundamental to how India would eventually codify its constitution, declaring India a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. This secularism was important because today, even after the partition, about 1 billion Indians are Hindu, 170 million are Muslim, and the remaining are either Sikh or Christian. Early leaders like Gandhi knew that for India to thrive, there would need to be peace between these groups. But this wasn't guaranteed, and the tensions would soon spill over into violence. At the time, the Muslim and Hindu regions of Bengal had been divided up between Pakistan and India. But in 1970, rising Bengali nationalism resulted in a pro-Bengali party winning enough seats to form a government and push for independence. Pakistan refused to acknowledge the election results, and in response launched a crackdown named Operation Searchlight. It was a brutal campaign that many have labeled a genocide. The following day, Bengali leaders declared their independence. The Bangladesh Liberation War had begun. So by this point, India was being led by Indira Gandhi, and she had found herself facing a humanitarian crisis. Millions of Bengalis fled the fighting and sought refuge in India. Struggling with the influx of migrants, Indira Gandhi took action and declared war on Pakistan in December of 1971. This was the nationalist cause Narendra Modi had been looking for. 
but he would never get the chance to take up arms for his people. Two weeks later, Pakistan was defeated and Bangladesh was born. But Modi was about to find another cause to fight for. India's leader, Indira Gandhi, was about to plunge the country into an unprecedented crisis. The president has proclaimed emergency. This is nothing to panic about. The emergency is a pivotal moment in Indian history and granted Indira Gandhi unprecedented power. At this point, I should clarify that Indira Gandhi wasn't related to Mahatma Gandhi. It's just a common name. In fact, Indira was the daughter of India's former leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, who many call the architect of modern India. During the Cold War, Nehru had been an advocate of Indian neutrality, not wanting to be sucked into a war between the great powers of the USSR and the USA. But when the USA announced they would sell weapons to Pakistan, India's historic enemy, India began leaning toward the Soviet Union. Nehru visited Moscow in 1955, resulting in Nikita Khrushchev agreeing to provide military aid to India. With the two countries becoming more economically aligned, it wasn't long until Soviet doctrine began creeping into Indian politics. Nehru lavished state resources on heavy industries like steel, coal mining, and power generation. In a speech outlining India's second five-year plan, Nehru said, we must start with the production of machine which makes the machine. After his death, his daughter Indira picked up where her father left off. After becoming prime minister, she nationalized India's coal, steel, and refining industries. She took control of the country's 14 largest banks, and in 1971 signed a treaty with the USSR promoting cooperation on a wide range of topics. This was the largest centralization of power in India's history, and led some to refer to Indira Gandhi as the Empress of India. But discontent was never far from the surface. The reforms led to rapidly rising food prices and caused huge strikes in Narendra Modi's home state of Gujarat. Similar protests broke out in the eastern Indian state of Bihar. A massive railway strike brought the country to a standstill, and yet those issues paled in significance to what would come next. On June 12, 1975, Gandhi was found guilty of electoral malpractice. The court ordered that she be stripped of her parliamentary seat, and under wow. India's system of government, you had to be a member of parliament in order to be a prime minister. The Times of India compared the verdict to firing the prime minister for a traffic ticket. But Indira Gandhi didn't budge. She declared a national state of emergency, citing imminent threats to the Indian state. The emergency was one of the most controversial periods of India's modern history. Many of Gandhi's political opponents were thrown in jail. The government even exploited the suspension of democracy by embarking on a forced sterilization program to control rising population levels. In addition to being highly controversial, the emergency was also the making of Narendra Modi. Despite being part of the now banned RSS, Modi had been a prominent activist during the emergency, gaining reputation for action and receiving publicity in national publications. Despite the RSS being pushed underground, Modi was still politically active, joining Gandhi's opposition, the Janata Party. Finally, after 21 months, Indira Gandhi ended the emergency and called fresh elections. Her tight grip of the media and large industry made Indira confident she would win, but she was wrong. For the first time ever, Congress lost power in India, and they didn't just lose. They were crushed by the opposition Janata Party, a marriage of convenience between several opposition parties, including one that Modi had joined years earlier. Moraji Desai became the first non-Congress prime minister of India. This was a huge turning point. Congress had dominated Indian politics since before independence. Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru gave it an aura that made it seem unbeatable, but the party's arrogance and complacency opened the door. Modi sensed an opportunity. After the ban on the RSS was overturned, he went to India's capital, Delhi. There, he wrote the RSS's official history of the emergency years. He was literally writing history. And at the same time, he was building a reputation for himself. Soon, fate would provide him with an even bigger opportunity. The Janata Party, which won the 1977 election, soon faced the problem that confronts every protest party created in a crisis. What happens when you solve the problem you were created to solve? The Janata Party was an unwieldy alliance. It brought together Hindu nationalists, farmers' rights advocates, socialists, and even a renegade faction of the Congress Party. Those contradictions, as well as the pressures of leadership, led to its collapse. One of the main problems was that the national leadership of the Hindu nationalists were much more moderate than the grassroots. The national leadership wanted to run the country and win another election while the grassroots were strongly connected to the RSS. Some members were even accused of involvement in sectarian riots that took place in 1978 and 1979. That frustrated modernizers within the National Party, as well as their coalition partners. Eventually, a fragment of the party broke off to form a secular revival. This meant the government lost its parliamentary majority. Voters weren't impressed. They punished the Janata Party in the 1980 general election, reducing it to just 31 out of 531 seats. Part of the problem was the state of the economy. Thanks in part to the economic planning of the National Congress, by 1981, India was reliant on loans from the International Monetary Fund. Following the elections, the Executive Council of the Janata Party, concerned that voters perceived it as too extreme, decreed that its members couldn't also be members of the RSS. That only worsened the split between the leadership and the grassroots. Mm -hmm. So in April of 1980, the members created a new political party with close ties to the RSS. They called it the Indian People's Party, but it goes by BJP, and Narendra Modi was one of its first members. Although by then, Indira Gandhi was again prime minister, hopes were high for the BJP. 
but no one was counting on what happened next. Good evening. Indira Gandhi, ruler of the world's largest democracy, died today, shot down by two of her own bodyguards. They were Sikhs taking revenge for the invasion of their temple in June. And tonight, mobs of Hindus have been attacking Sikhs in cities throughout the subcontinent. The assassination of Indira Gandhi stemmed from Operation Blue Star, an Indian military plan to remove a charismatic Sikh militant from one of the holiest sites in Sikhism. Official numbers put the death toll at more than 550 Sikh militants and civilians, and 83 soldiers. Distraught and enraged, Gandhi's bodyguard shot her as an act of revenge. 36 years later, in the same city, sectarian violence had claimed the life of another Indian leader named Gandhi. The retaliation was swift and brutal. In the aftermath of the assassination, an estimated 8,000 Sikhs were killed in riots and oh, targeted wow. attacks. Mahatma Gandhi and his protege Nehru knew that sectarian violence was one of the biggest challenges India would face following independence. Mutual hatred of the British helped keep a lid on violence during the colonial era, but independence and the chaos of partition threatened to unleash a tidal wave. Gandhi's assassination meant a new election was required. The BJP was led by Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Despite being one of the party's co-founders, his own moderate social politics resembled Mahatma Gandhi's socialism. But in an election where voters were sympathetic to the Congress party, he simply didn't give people a strong enough reason to vote for him. The BJP won two seats in India's parliament. The failure of his moderate strategy caused the party to search for a different way forward. An opportunity presented itself right away. The VHP, a member of the group of nationalist organizations led by the RSS, began a campaign to construct a Hindu temple dedicated to the deity Rama in a popular city. They believed that the site was Rama's birthplace. There was only one problem. There was already a mosque on the site. The BHP went all in on the campaign to demolish the Babri Mosque. That made the Congress party very nervous. Rajiv Gandhi, who took over as prime minister after his mother Indira's assassination, wanted to neutralize the issue by promising to permit Hindu prayer at the Babri Mosque. After that angered Muslims, he appeased them by banning the import of Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. Then when that didn't work, he endorsed the construction of a Hindu temple in the city. While all this was going on, the RSS sent its rising star, Narendra Modi, to Gujarat. His job was to whip the party into shape and organize its campaigns in municipal elections in the city of Madhubad. The campaign was a huge success. And today, official biographies credit Modi as the mastermind behind the scenes. As a reward, in 1987, he was promoted to organizing secretary of the BJP's Gujarat branch. His job was to increase the prominence and popularity of the BJP, and by extension, the RSS. It wouldn't take very long for both of those things to happen, but it didn't have all that much to do with Modi. The VHP's ability to mobilize public opinion was tested in the city of Ayodhya in 1992, when a mob of their supporters stormed the Babri Mosque. The aim was to destroy the symbol of Islam, the battle that followed claimed 1,200 lives and sparked a frenzy of violence across India. In late 1990, the BJP's leader made a pilgrimage to the city. When Hindu protesters showed up in December, police opened fire, killing dozens and further inflaming pensions. When protesters returned in 1992, they overwhelmed security and attacked the mosque with pickaxes. Hours later, it was nothing but dust and rubble. To this day, it's not clear if the destruction of the Babri Mosque was a spontaneous act or the culmination of a carefully orchestrated plan. But what is clear is that several leading Hindu nationalist figures provoked it. You might have thought that because of India's high levels of religious and ethnic diversity and the pride its leaders took in cultivating religious toleration, that the destruction of the Babri Mosque would have been bad news for the BJP. It was quite the opposite. In 1995, the party won a massive majority in the Gujarat state election. In the space of just 10 years, the Gujarat state parliament went from being dominated by the sky blue of the Congress party to being bathed in the saffron orange of the BJP. The best way to describe what the BJP was doing was that it was teaching Hindus to resent the existing political system, which had been specifically crafted by the Congress party mm -hmm. to avoid one group dominating any other. Hindus represented the majority. Moreover, they represented India itself. So why shouldn't they receive special treatment? Given the country's long history with religiously motivated violence, this was dangerous thinking, but it was intoxicating. The riots that culminated in the destruction of the Babri Mosque were a symbol of a country whose politics were changing rapidly, and Narendra Modi was on the ground driving that change. The following year, the BJP became the largest party in the national parliament. But before he could turn his attention to New Delhi, Modi was still needed at home. The BJP were running Gujarat, but they hadn't actually chosen a leader. One of them, Shankarsan Vigela, was an experienced legislator. The other, Kashubai Patel, had joined the RSS before India gained independence. The BJP's leadership, including Modi, threw their support behind Patel. Vigela didn't exactly like that. In fact, he rebelled and threatened to leave the party. Terrified of losing the political advantage they'd worked so hard to create, the BJP backtracked and installed Vigela as chief minister of Gujarat. Modi, punished for backing the wrong horse, was temporarily banished from his home state. That still wasn't enough for Vigela, though. He still left the BJP in order to form his own splinter group, bringing down the government in the process. Eventually, after fresh elections in February of 1998, the BJP emerged with a clear majority. Vigela was out of the picture. Patel was installed as chief minister of Gujarat. Meanwhile, that same month, national elections produced an inconclusive result. Congress and the BJP couldn't be separated. After some wrangling, the BJP formed a coalition and Vajpayee was named prime minister. And just like that, Gujarat and India were both led by the BJP. In May of 1998, Modi was promoted to general secretary, but it wouldn't be long until he was called to a higher post. By 2001, Patel's health was failing. 
And frankly, so was his government. The BJP's national leadership decided Gujarat needed a new chief minister. Modi didn't have any political experience, but he was an effective organizer and deeply committed to the goals of the BJP. On October 3rd, he was appointed chief minister and given the task of leading the BJP to victory in the following year's election. Barely two weeks after his 50th birthday, Narendra Modi suddenly found himself leading a state of more than 50 million people. After years of effort, he had accomplished something amazing, but his career as a politician was almost over as suddenly as it began. Murder, rape, houses torched, people burned alive. Over 1,000 people have died and more than 100,000 have become refugees in their own land. The violence which spread all across Gujarat began in late February, after this train carrying Hindu pilgrims was attacked by Muslims. One carriage was torched, and 58 people died, mostly women and children. Hindu mobs responded with murder and arson. India has never been a stranger to violence. For centuries, zealots killed in the name of their religion. But this time felt different, because this time it felt like the government was on the side of the perpetrators. The police and authorities in Gujarat were accused of standing back and allowing the violence to unfold, or even encouraging it. Human Rights Watch said that the Gujarat state administration had been engaged in a massive cover-up of the state's role in the massacres. Four days after the violence broke out, Narendra Modi and India's Home Minister, LK Advani, visited the scene to call for peace. But they were both members of the BJP, a party which based its entire identity on Hindu supremacism. Advani was even one of the BJP's co-founders, so a lot of people questioned their sincerity, especially when it emerged that Modi had gathered police at his home and ordered them not to stop the Hindu backlash. A secret police document even seemed to show that local police had conducted a secret census to gain detailed information about the Muslim community and prepare an attack. During the riots, Hindu houses were left untouched, while Muslim houses right next door were destroyed. The extent to which Modi was personally involved in the riots remains hotly debated. But legally, the matter is closed. After 20 years of back and forth in the legal system, India's Supreme Court ruled that he had no case to answer. Of course, by then, Modi was prime minister and the most powerful man in the country. The BJP held a convention a few weeks after the riots. Party moderates, sensing an opportunity to get rid of an influential rival, planned on calling on him to resign. But when Modi spoke, the crowd roared their approval. Far from being the end of his political career, the riots in Gujarat were more like the beginning. When it came time for the next state elections, the BJP knew they had no other option. Modi was the only choice. The election was a referendum on the riots. Modi went on the attack, framing criticism of his government as an attack on Gujarati pride and boasting that he had delivered peace and stability to Gujarat. His strategy was successful. The BJP won a big majority and Modi had his first election victory. The 2002 Gujarat election campaign was a big turning point in both Modi's political career and the trajectory of Indian politics as a whole because it proved once and for all that doubling down on Hinduva was popular. There was still some fallout to navigate from the riots. When the BJP surprisingly lost the 2004 general elections, the defeated BJP Prime Minister Atal Vajpayee cited the riots as a reason for his defeat and even said it was a mistake to let Modi stay in office. And Western nations were asking hard questions about Modi's role in the Gujarat riots. The George W. Bush administration even denied him a visa to the United States in 2005. Mm -hmm. But by now, Modi knew that, despite what Westerners and Congress Party supporters thought, he'd found a winning strategy. He started attending only Hindu religious ceremonies. On a couple of occasions, he even refused to wear clothing gifted by Muslim leaders. But he knew that people needed more than just stunts. They needed him to govern. So his second term as chief minister of Gujarat, Modi rebranded himself as an economic reformer. Again, he saw an opportunity to draw a contrast with the Congress party. Like I said earlier, Congress's first generation of leaders pursued socialist economics. They did things like invest in heavy industry, put up barriers to trade, and subsidize farmers. In essence, they chose redistribution over economic growth. You know, making sure everyone has an equally large slice of the pie rather than growing the pie bigger. Partly that was because of their own beliefs about economics, but it was also about politics. Handing out money to politically important sectors of the economy won lots of votes. But that approach had major long-term consequences for India's economy. At the start of the 1990s, India was still a closed system with a fixed exchange rate. And when that system led to major balance of payments problems, India's economy suddenly found itself in crisis. Its share of global economic output fell to 1%, an all-time low. That crisis and the ensuing collapse of the government ushered in some much-needed economic reforms. Barriers to imports were reduced. Subsidies for key commodities like fertilizer and sugar were reduced. And plans were made to sell off public enterprises. India's leaders didn't have to look very far to see how more open economies could perform. In the 1990s, the Asian tigers achieved rapid growth by opening their economies to trade and foreign investment. In 1950, India and South Korea had about the same GDP. But by the year 2000, South Korea was about seven times richer per capita. That's not to say India didn't have advantages like services, but they didn't scale as well as what was happening in East Asia. But changes in policies can create changes in cultures. No one understood that better than Narendra Modi. He saw that a new middle class, one that was pro-business and pro-entrepreneurship was emerging. Sure, lots of them cared about their religion, but they also cared about getting good jobs or starting businesses. Modi's secret sauce was pretty simple. He made big investments in basic infrastructure, reduced corruption, and improved the quality of governance, and gave businesses big handouts to attract investment. Some people called his approach Modi-nomics. 
Others called it the Gujarat model. During his time as chief minister of Gujarat, the state's economy grew by 10% a year. That was faster than the country as a whole. And it was enough to inspire articles that compared Gujarat to Guangdong, the Chinese province, which underpinned China's incredible growth during the 90s. Hindu nationalism and pro-business economics was a powerful combination, but Modi had written the BJP's official history of the emergency. He knew that the person who controlled the message had a huge advantage. In the run-up to the 2012 Gujarat state elections, Modi used holographic technology and satellite link-ups to address audiences across the state, all from a studio. Let's be honest, the tech isn't very impressive, but that's not the point. The point is that he was in four places at once. Modi was making the most of his huge personal appeal with the sort of political skills that, frankly, his political opponents just didn't seem capable of. And it wasn't just holograms either. Modi also harnessed social media better than anyone else in Indian politics. He crossed 1 million Twitter followers weeks before the election. Today, he has 91 million. He was also active on Facebook, maintained a blog, and started a YouTube channel which hosted a bunch of his speeches and press conferences. Every road that was built, every village that was electrified, every new plant that was opened, Modi talked about them all. And it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Modi, the politician, was also Modi, the marketer. It wasn't all smooth sailing. Performance across indicators like education and nutrition flatlined or went backwards. But whatever wasn't part of the narrative didn't make it to Twitter. The narrative was that Gujarat was a dynamic, fast-moving state led by a dynamic, fast-moving leader. And after 12 years, that leader was ready to mount his challenge for the top job. During his 12 and a half years as chief minister of Gujarat, Narendra Modi broke the mold of Indian politics by combining pro-business economics and pro-Hindu politics. He turned appeals to self-interest into an ideology, and in the process became the most influential person in the BJP, and one of the most important people in India. But there was still one question he had to answer. Could he scale that political strategy from Gujarat, a state of 62 million people, to a country of 1.3 billion? In September of 2013, Modi was named the BJP's candidate for prime minister ahead of the 2014 elections. And almost immediately, the campaign became a referendum on him. He promised to bring the dynamic economic growth he'd helped create in Gujarat to India broadly. He pledged to build a Hindu temple on the site of the destroyed Babri Mosque. He pitched himself as the representative of an authentic India, a man battling to take back the country from complacent former leaders who didn't pay enough attention to the concerns of the Hindu majority. Just to prove his point, a senior Congress politician referring to Modi said that a tea seller should never become prime minister of India. Well, he did. The BJP became the first party to win a majority of seats in its own right since 1984. They performed especially well in parts of India that had recently experienced violence among Hindus and Muslims. And despite that, they still won 10% of the Muslim vote. On May 26, 2014, Narendra Modi was sworn in as the 14th Prime Minister of India. It was the culmination of a major shift decades in the making. The Sangh Parivar, a family of Hindu organizations like the RSS and the BJP, taught Hindus to vote in their own self-interest. And now that it was out, the genie wasn't going back in the bottle. Modi moved fast. He immediately strengthened links between the BJP and the RSS, the paramilitary organization that upheld Hindu culture across India. He appointed RSS members to lead universities and research institutions and passed a bill to increase government control over the appointment of judges. While investigations were launched against several NGOs, including Doctors Without Borders, on the grounds that they were undermining economic growth. Hindutva had become official government policy. So had neoliberal economics. Modi reduced government spending on social services while cutting taxes. As part of the Make in India initiative launched in September of 2014, Modi opened key sectors like railways, defense, and medical devices to higher levels of foreign direct investment. The next day, Modi visited the United States, the country that rejected his visa application less than 10 years earlier because of his role in the Gujarat riots. This time around, Modi visited the US to meet Barack Obama and address the UN. He was out of the Western diplomatic deep freeze. In fact, Modi's first political headache didn't come until November 2016, two and a half years into his first term, and it was self-inflicted. To break the grief of corruption and black money, we have decided that the 500 rupee and 1,000 rupee currency notes presently in use will no longer be legal tender from midnight to night. With one press conference, Modi made 86% of India's currency disappear. It was classic Modi. He identified a real problem, the use of black money that funded corruption and terrorism, and then he devised a solution that caused almost as many problems. It was total chaos. The move led to prolonged cash shortages. People died waiting in line to deposit their banknotes. It's estimated that the move cost 1.5 million jobs and cut 1% off India's GDP. But it still didn't stop India from being the fastest growing economy in the world in 2016. Modi was making a bet that, despite the disruption, people would be impressed by his decisiveness. Clearly, people didn't mind too much. The BJP and its allies formed government in six of the seven states that went to the polls in 2017, including India's most populous state of Uttar Pradesh. Demonization wasn't Modi's only major economic reform during his first term. He also introduced a goods and services tax to simplify the country's tax code. That too had lots of implementation problems. When the first GST returns were filed in August of 2017, the system crashed. In the end, 
demonetization and the GST were both part of a strategy that Modi had been cultivating ever since he started making a real name for himself during the emergency. He was a man of action. It wouldn't be long before he again needed to show it. At around 3.15 p.m. on February 14, 2019. Terrorists from the Jaisi Mohammed carried out a major attack in the Pulwama district. A car laden with more than 100 kilograms of explosives rammed into the CRPF bus, killing 40 personnel in an instant. But the fallout didn't end there. National security was an important part of Modi's political brand, so he couldn't let this go by without a response. Despite a Pakistan-based terrorist group quickly claiming responsibility, Modi and the rest of his government were quick to blame Pakistan itself. Twelve days after the attack, the Indian military carried out a cross-border airstrike. Although they claimed it was a preemptive strike against a terrorist training group, open-source satellite imagery showed that no targets of consequence were hit, but tensions between India and Pakistan still surged to dangerous levels. Soldiers from both sides exchanged small arms and mortar fire. Pakistan struck back with its own retaliatory airstrike inside Jammu and Kashmir. The Prime Minister Imran Khan even claimed that his military pilots successfully locked on to Indian military installations, but chose to drop bombs on open ground instead. Pakistan even shot down an Indian Air Force MiG-21, taking its pilot prisoner. After a nervous month, the two sides eventually agreed to end hostilities in March of 2019. But Modi, always the political entrepreneur, saw an opportunity. The attack and subsequent skirmishes happened just weeks before the next general election, and they became a core part of his appeal for re-election. The campaign was about lots of things, national security, democratic backsliding, and the performance of the economy. But just like in 2014, it was really about just one man, Narendra Modi. In a campaign dominated by nationalist rhetoric, he portrayed himself as the protector of India and the protector of Hindus. He was rewarded with the highest vote share of any party since 1989. The BJP had a majority, and Modi became India's most powerful leader since Indira Gandhi. The 2019 election marked a turning point in how Modi governed India. He shifted to a more majoritarian agenda and intensified attacks on press freedom and civil liberties. He immediately used his mandate to do three things which Hindu nationalists had been demanding. First, he banned the practice of triple talaq, a practice whereby a Muslim man could legally divorce his wife by saying the Arabic word for divorce three times in a row. Then he repealed the special autonomous status of the Muslim majority state of Jammu and Kashmir. Previously, Jammu and Kashmir was administered by India without formally being part of India. Political reforms changed that. They turned Jammu and Kashmir into two separate union territories, basically Indian states which were controlled by the federal government in New Delhi. After the legislation passed, the region was placed under lockdown for months. Thousands of people who protested it, including hundreds of political leaders, were detained. But it was Modi's third action which attracted the most criticism. In December of 2019, India's parliament passed an amendment to the Citizenship Act to provide an accelerated path to citizenship for persecuted religious minorities from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Except there was one religious group that was conspicuously excluded, Muslims. The act allowed religion to be used as a criterion of citizenship under Indian law for the first time. Was it a generous humanitarian act or blatant anti-Muslim persecution? Or maybe even both, you decide. The Supreme Court didn't hear any challenges to either the assimilation of Jammu and Kashmir or the Citizen Amendment Act. It basically proved that the critics who had warned about Modi undermining democratic institutions were right, but they couldn't do anything to stop it. Indians weren't living in Gandhi's or Nehru's India anymore. They were living in Narendra Modi's India. The passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act led to more religious violence. Riots between Hindus and Muslims in New Delhi in March of 2020 left dozens of people dead and hundreds injured. People weren't just targeted for their religion. Journalists were shot at, confronted about their religion, and prevented from documenting violence. Targeting journalists was nothing new in India, or in many places around the world. But as Hindu nationalists learned how to behave with impunity, attacks were becoming more frequent and more brazen. Modi had fulfilled the promises he made to his supporters in the RSS. There was just one last thing he had to do. India's prime minister has laid the foundation stone for a Hindu temple uh, that's being built on a site that's been contested between Muslims and Hindus for decades. The temple is being constructed here in the northern city of Ayodhya. Almost 30 years after the Babri Mosque was destroyed by Hindu nationalists, the Hindu nationalists who ran the country showed up to lay the foundation stone for the Hindu temple that will one day replace it. Narendra Modi was sending a clear signal to both his supporters and his critics. Despite what the constitution might say, India was a Hindu majoritarian country. The greatest challenge facing Narendra Modi's critics is that he was undermining democracy by democratic means. He had changed India forever, not just its laws and its culture either. Since Modi became prime minister, investment in transport infrastructure has tripled as a share of GDP. The number of airports has almost doubled. India has 823 million broadband connections and 750 million smartphones. People use technology to do their banking, pay their bills, and follow the prime minister on Twitter. It's no wonder the majority of the country's Hindus, all one billion of them, love what he's doing. Narendra Modi has changed India, but how has he changed India's place in the world? When he first ran for prime minister, Modi didn't talk much about foreign policy. If he did, it was mostly through the lens of national security. Otherwise, there just weren't many votes in it. But he's managed to craft an effective foreign policy built partly on principles inherited from his predecessors and partly on new approaches for a changing world. We've spoken about a lot of the basic components of India's foreign policy already. India was hesitant about formal alliances and didn't want to get entangled in outside wars. Pakistan and China have always been rivals. The Soviet Union was a friend, but not quite an ally. These remain principles of India's foreign policy under Modi to this day, but lots has changed. India has changed, and so has China. China's emergence 
emergence as an assertive economic and military power in the Indo-Pacific under Xi Jinping has greatly unsettled India's leaders. Both sides have grievances. Xi Jinping has deepened already strong military ties with Pakistan. Modi's decision to create two new union territories in Kashmir sparked Chinese concerns about India's intentions in the area. At the same time, India is nervous about the way Beijing, through the Belt and Road Initiative, is vying for influence with smaller South Asian nations that have traditionally been in India's sphere of influence. Fundamentally, China's rise is an existential threat to India's strategic autonomy. Add in large doses of nationalism from both sides, and tensions are inevitable. That border skirmish I mentioned in the intro wasn't the first one since Xi Jinping came to power, and it probably won't be the last. But China's rise hasn't just made India nervous. It's made the entire Western world nervous, and that's given Narendra Modi a major opportunity. A show of unity from the US and three allies whose spheres of influence span the Indo-Pacific, a region under pressure on many fronts from an increasingly assertive China. The Quad is an informal grouping between India, the US, Australia, and Japan. It says its goal is a free and open Indo-Pacific, but everyone knows that it's really about keeping China in check. In addition to talking about security challenges, the four nations also take part in regular joint military exercises. It's not quite an alliance, though. Just because India under Modi wants to constrain Chinese influence in Asia doesn't mean it agrees that the West should be the dominant power. But the Quad is a good example of the balancing act Modi has been trying to pull off with his foreign policy. Western leaders understand that India's actions are essentially pragmatic. No one expects that India would join a hypothetical conflict over Taiwan. Russia is still India's biggest arms supplier. And India has been buying heavily discounted Russian oil ever since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, an invasion which Modi didn't condemn. But as the competition between China and the West begins to resemble a second Cold War, Narendra Modi is considering whether this time India might need to pick a side. In June 2023, Narendra Modi visited the United States. It was his seventh visit overall, but his first official state visit. He addressed a joint session of U.S. Congress for a second time, a rare honor afforded to leaders like Winston Churchill and Nelson Mandela. In the past few years, there have been many advances in AI, artificial intelligence, at the same time, there have been even more momentous development in another AI, America and India. If Joe Biden was worried about how Narendra Modi has undermined India's historic commitment to democracy and religious pluralism, he didn't show it. Conditionally, slowly, and maybe just temporarily, India under Narendra Modi is shifting closer to the West on important matters of geopolitics. There's still distrust and reluctance from both sides. Relationships defined more by common enemies than common interests can be fragile. But there is real progress. Since Narendra Modi became prime minister, India and the US have stepped up cooperation on defense, trade, and emerging technologies. But the lasting ties will probably be the economic ones. Two months before Modi's visit to the US, Apple opened its first store. The company now assembles 7% of its phones in India. Just days later, Foxconn broke ground on a $500 million factory. India now accounts for 40% of the world's digital transactions. GDP is growing rapidly, and investment as a share of GDP is the highest it's been for a decade. At current growth rates, its economy will overtake Germany's and Japan's within five years. And as Western countries and companies look to diversify their supply chains away from China, India will look like an increasingly attractive proposition. During the Cold War, India remained neutral between the United States and the Soviet Union. But the reality is that India just didn't matter very much back then. Today, India is the world's biggest country and an increasingly important strategic player. It's one of the West's most important hedges against Chinese influence, while at the same time, it's helping to prop up Vladimir Putin and the Russian economy. At the heart of all of this is Narendra Modi, the tea seller's son from Gujarat. He's made India more assertive in international affairs, more dynamic economically, and maybe, most of all, more Hindu in its culture and politics. Today, he dominates India just as much as the National Congress ever did. He is by far the world's most popular elected leader, in charge of the world's biggest political party. As the story of the 21st century continues to be written, he will be one of its most important figures. So I think before I even start a video, what I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, how I have a video about uh, why is everyone uh, becoming a fan of India? This is exactly the reason what he has just said at the very, very end, uh, that I, and it's not the views, <laughs> it is exactly the economical power and everything that he, yeah, I, I think he expressed it really well. So I just wanted to to say that one to, to those uh, that uh, think otherwise, um, that's, I think, the, the key reason. Now, before I even jump into any kind of commentary on this, I wanted to say that uh, obviously I appreciate that this video is, is done from the Western point of view. I, I like to think I come to this from, uh, with an open mind. So I would like to invite you to let me know in the comments what are the parts that you agree or not agree uh, for the matter. Obviously, I, I know nothing about this, okay? So this was like all new news for me. 
uh, obviously some bits and pieces here and there I've already kind of been aware of, but that was an interesting um, kind of history overview of, of, of the persona and perhaps what has been going on in India. Now, I don't think I want to comment on this because I can't, right? Like I, I can only just, um, you know, obviously I see his point of view, um, uh, what he wanted to get through, but I'm sure that you guys might have your own, um, all right? But I think from what he had said, like I, I now I understand, I think where perhaps the West might be coming from uh, on, uh, on, on certain issues, uh, but yeah, I, I really cannot comment on that. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a few things that I wanted to ask you. Um, and first was about Salman Rushdie. Uh, I feel like I need to go back and rewatch that part uh, about him because uh, when I was studying English literature, um, I had one of my uh, back then teachers. She was a really big fan of Salman Rushdie's. I actually even read his Midnight Children. Um, and uh, it was very interestingly written. <laughs> I remember me reading it. It was so hard to read. Um, back then I was studying English and my English wasn't that great. Um, and I was like back then at the at a computer with a Macmillan dictionary trying to type every second word to, to understand what that was. Um, it's a magic realism genre. Uh, but I've never actually got around... Um, reading the satanic verses and now i'm actually thinking to or, or search why he was you know prosecuted and, and and all that so if you guys know that uh, uh let me know in the comments and what these satanic verses are actually about i never actually really even made myself to go and and research that part um now what was interesting for me to learn in that video uh was the the fact that Indira Gandhi was the daughter on Nehru, um, on Nehru. So I was actually shocked. I did not know that. Um, yeah, so basically, um, according to you, the, um, the, 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 the thing that never left, I guess, she's part of that, right? So um, interesting to see. I was actually quite shocked, and I think that some of you might even remember the pulling out of these notes to to fight, ter uh, you know, corruption and stuff like that. It's uh, it's interesting that from one day to another, you you're losing a lot of money like that. I presume back then the cash was the key source of money. So uh, I, I I would love to actually know how that went down and to what you guys thought about it because he had said in the video that most of people were kind of okay-ish with that. So I would love to know a bit more about that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a very interesting thing. One thing that uh, maybe it's a different take on, on, on the video, but uh, I guess there, there are two things that that stuck in my head and one is uh, the countries are you know um basically it's not even about i feel like stay with me um i feel like it's not just about it's actually not even about politics it's about economical interests is actually this is why sometimes i don't know Obviously, about you, you've, you've had Modi for quite some time, but it does feel in the world that whether you, whoever you select, at least in the Western world, and I think it's becoming more and more apparent, uh, whether you, whoever you vote for, nothing ever changes. And I think that the reason is clear now to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but that is how I'm reading the situation. And that as long as you're following our um, economical interests, um, you're fine. So you're only, country is only as good as, as the, the level of money that can be instructed or influence imposed. It's interesting, no? What do you guys think? Let me know. And, um, the second thing, what made me think about the way he presented Modi, um, but it, I don't think it just applies to Modi, right? Like, I think it's, it's in general, it's the, 
art of communication and art of understanding how people minds are and how they operate and uh, if if you know that uh, and i hope and i would like to think <laughs> would like to think I, I would think that politicians know that um, and because of that they're able to exploit and run narratives and bend facts um, in their way so this is a general statement nothing nothing to do with modi this just occurred to me uh, because i know you guys a lot ask for facts and yeah that is definitely uh, a good thing and right thing to do but i think that to to understand things you really need to understand the context and you are you need to be able to interpret things in a context and um i think i've had a conversation with someone even when it comes to data you can manipulate the data however you want i've seen it in my line of work as well you can you can create narratives however you want and you can support it with facts <laughs> yet still it will be misguided so that's just a food for thought um yeah again uh i am not targeting this on anyone this is general observation um as to perhaps how manipulation works in general um so it's not just a political level it's a company levels etc it's 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 interesting i think to to think about it and to realize how you know when you're just claiming yes she has facts she has facts she has everything but yeah <laughs> uh, but how the facts are being interpreted and what is shown and what is not shown unless you really go and do your own research and unless you actually understand the subject deep enough to be able to uh, draw the right correlations and um, yeah it might not be true and even then you will perhaps not know the facts this is why i think that politics is pointless because there is a gazillion of things no one is going to tell you so i think <laughs> my rant is over thank you so so much for watching this video with me i hope you enjoyed it if you did please give a thumbs up share a like and subscribe to this channel and i'll see you in the next one until then please do take care sending much much love bye, -bye.